Due to the graphic nature of this video, viewer discretion is advised. What if I told you a story about a gang of serial killers? Satanic worshipping serial killers who abducted, tortured, and impartially cannibalized their victims. Would you think this would be a plot for a Hollywood horror movie? While it would make for an interesting film, I can assure you that this was, in fact, a real gang. Four men who would terrorize Chicago and its north and western suburbs for nearly two years before being brought to justice. Their crimes so violent and twisted that this gang would earn the dubious nickname the Ripper Crew because of the similarities between their crimes and the ones committed by London's Jack the Ripper. Timeline of the Killings May 23rd, 1981, Chicago, 11 p.m. At the intersection of Broadway and Addison that you see here, just a few blocks from Wrigley Field, Linda Sutton prostitute was approached by a man named Robin Gecht, the leader of the Ripper Group. After some talking, she got into his red van. Also present, the other members of this gang, Edward Spritzer, along with Thomas Andrew Cucarellis. They drove west for approximately 30 minutes until the van came to a stop. They had arrived at the Br'er Rabbit Motel in Villa Park, Illinois. Where you see here. It is a rent by the hour motel, which is still in business to this day. This is where Ed Spritzer had been living at the time. Bound and gagged, Linda Sutton was taken into Spritzer's room, where she was beaten, tortured, and assaulted. She was assaulted a second time later that night and was taken out into a wooded area behind the motel. Robin Gecht and Andrew Cogarellis removed of her breasts and killed Linda Sutton. Just over a week later, on June the 1st, 1981, her body was discovered. The second killing took place on July 1st, 1981, after a woman was picked up near this intersection at Route 83 and North Avenue. Robin Geck picked up this female hitchhiker. She was forced to take some pills after getting into the van soon after became ill. Ripper crew drove to a cemetery nearby where the woman was pulled out of the van and Robin Gicht struck her twice with a baseball bat. Gicht returned to the van with the baseball bat and one of the victim's breasts. The identity of this woman is unknown to this day. The third killing took place in August 1981. Gecht and Spritzer drove to Winchell's Donut Shop so Spritzer could collect his paycheck. Soon after leaving, they saw a female hitchhiker and pulled over to pick her up. They drove to a nearby forest preserve and parked their van. The two handcuffed the woman, and while Spritzer stayed by the van, the other crew members took the woman into the woods. According to Spritzer, the crew returned to the van a few minutes later with one of the victim's breasts. The identity of this woman is also unknown to this day. May 15th, 1982, Elmhurst, Illinois, approximately 8 a.m. While walking from her apartment to her job at Remax Realtors, Lorraine Borowski became the fourth victim of the Ripper Crew. In a statement to police, Spritzer said the four men went looking for a girl that morning. After searching in vain for some time, they stopped to get something to eat and had a few beers. When 
When they finished, their search continued. Just as Lorraine was about to open up the office for the morning, Gekti crew literally lifted Miss Sparowski out of her shoes and threw her into their red van and raced off. They drove to a cemetery nearby. Spritzer said that he had fallen asleep in the back of the van and was woken up by noise outside. When he went out to look, he saw Gekt and Andy Cocarellis by a tombstone stabbing Lorraine Borowski. After finishing what they were doing, they returned to the van with the murder weapon and a severed breast. Her remains were found by a boy riding through the cemetery on his bike on October 20th, 1982 in an underdeveloped area of Clarendon Hills Cemetery, located in Darien, Illinois. Victim number five, Shui Mock, last seen alive at 1 a.m. on May 29th, 1982, when she got out of her brother's car after having an argument on their way home from work at their parents' restaurant in Hanover Park. After getting out of her brother's car, she told them that she would get a ride from their parents, who were following them home at some distance behind them. This would be the decision that would cost her her life. Her parents did not see her walking on the side of the road because of the late hour, and it wasn't until after reaching their home in Lombard that they found out about the argument with her brother, and that she got out and was walking, waiting for her parents to see her. After realizing what happened, the family went back to search for her, but it was too late. Robin Gex and his gang had already come across their daughter. According to Ed Spritzer's statement to police, they saw Miss Mock walking on the side of the road and they offered her a ride. She said yes and got into the infamous red van. They drove for 20 minutes when they stopped at a construction site in South Barrington. After being drugged, she was pulled out of the van and placed into a nearby wooded area where she was assaulted and eventually stabbed to death. Her body was discovered on September 30th, 1982. August 27th, 1982, Chicago. Sandra Delaware, a prostitute, was at the intersection of North Avenue and the Chicago River when she was approached by Robin Gecht in his red van. After talking for a minute, she got in and they drove for a few minutes, eventually stopping when they had reached the Fullerton Avenue Bridge where it crosses over the Chicago River. After parking, they took her out of the van, her wrists and ankles bound by shoelaces and a ligature around her neck. They then took her under the bridge where she was assaulted and murdered. Her body was discovered later that day. The autopsy revealed the cause of death was ligature strangulation with an abdominal stab wound which penetrated the liver. Miss Delaware was only 18 years old. September 8th, 1982, Chicago. Rose Beck Davis would become the seventh victim of the Ripper Crew. She was employed by a Chicago business that did marketing and sales, and during the evening of September 7th, she was in downtown Chicago with a client. Mrs. Davis last spoke to her husband around 10.30 that night, when she called him to let him know that she was on her way home. Unfortunately for her, she never made it. While on her way to her car, she was pulled into Gecht's van by Andy Cocarellis. They drove to 1250 North Lakeshore Drive in Chicago's ritzy Gold Coast neighborhood. And between the two buildings there and a courtyard, Mrs. Davis was assaulted by Gecht while Spritzer and the Cocarellis brothers strangled her to death. She was found later that morning. The Chief Medical Examiner of Cook County, Dr. Robert Stein, performed the autopsy on September 9th. According to Dr. Stein, the evidence established that Mrs. Davis had been beaten, strangled, cut, and then impaled with a wooden object. 
Such a horrific crime committed in such an exclusive neighborhood shocked the city. October 6th, 1982, Chicago. Rafael Torado and Alberto Rosario would become the eighth and ninth known victims of the Ripper Crew. But one was killed in a much different way from the group's previous killings. One, in that the victims were both men, and two, they were only shot. While standing on the corner of Damon and Lemoyne Avenues on the northwest side of the city, the two men were shot. Rosario would be taken to the hospital and survive the attack. Rafael Torado was not so fortunate. He was shot once in the head and once in the neck. He arrived DOA at the hospital. According to Ed Spreitzer's statement to Chicago police after his eventual arrest, he said that Geck told him to slow down as he was driving the van. After pulling over to the side of the road at this intersection, Gecht pulled out a 38 caliber revolver and a hunting rifle from the back of the van. It was at this point that Torado and Rosario were shot, and the men sped off into the night. The tenth and final known victim was a woman by the name of Beverly Washington. The one difference from the previous victims of the Ripper crew is that Miss Washington survived her encounter and his crew and would be instrumental in bringing them to justice. She was working in an industrial area close to the intersection of Elston and North Avenues on Chicago's north side on October 6th, the same day that Toronto and Rosario were both attacked. Gecht offered her money for her services and after getting into the van was driven to a vacant lot close by. After stopping, she was handcuffed, assaulted, and forced to take some pills which made her sick. She soon after lost consciousness and a breast was removed. She was then taken to the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad tracks by the intersection of Maplewood and West Fulton Streets. It was there that she was left in a garbage pile by the crew. But this time they made a very crucial mistake Miss Washington was still alive. An old man, searching for aluminum cans to recycle, found her in that garbage heap, naked and bleeding profusely. After discovering that she was alive but unconscious, the man ran and called police. She was rushed to the Illinois Masonic Hospital and was treated. Because of the severity of her wounds, she was initially unable to speak so she communicated to police with handwritten notes and hand gestures. Her description of Gek's van would ultimately lead to the Ripper crew's arrest, their murder spree finally brought to an end. Arrests of the Ripper crew members. It was on October 20th, 1982, that would be the beginning of the end for Gek, Spritzer, the Cocorellas brothers. Chicago police put out the information about the red van, and on this night, two officers spotted the van. The two veteran officers, Thomas Flynn and Philip Murphy, each of them were 20 years on the force, questioned the driver of the van, Ed Spritzer, and his passenger, who was Robin Gecht's older brother. When the roadside stop was over, the two agreed to go with the officers to the police station for further questioning. After finding out the owner of the van was Robin Gecht, police looked up and found his criminal record. He had had a few run-ins with the police a few years prior to 1982. The most sinister one was for his arrest for raping a 14-year-old girl in 1980. For this crime, he received felony probation. So they went to Gecht's home and arrested him. The police then took Spritzer and the Gecht brothers to the hospital, where Beverly Washington was recovering from her wounds. A lineup was held outside her room in the hallway, where she quickly identified Ed Spritzer and Robin Gecht as two of her attackers. The Cocorellas brothers were arrested soon after.
Convictions On November 7th, 1982, Robin Gecht was formally arrested and charged for the attack on Beverly, Washington. He was charged with attempted murder, deviant sexual assault, aggravated kidnapping, and aggravated battery. Andrew Cocarellis was also formally charged on the same date for the murder of Rose Becca Davis. He also confessed to authorities the murders of Lorraine Borowski and several other unidentified women. Edward Spritzer was charged for his involvement in the murders of Lorraine Borowski, Rose Davis, along with several other women as well. Thomas Cocarellis was charged with murder for the deaths of Lorraine Borowski and Linda Sutton. Numerous trials were conducted because the crew's crimes took place in different cities and different counties. DuPage County and Cook County was where most took place, and the results of the trial were as follows. Robin Gecht was convicted of the attempted murder, aggravated kidnapping, deviant sexual assault, and rape of Beverly Washington. He was sentenced to concurrent terms of imprisonment for the crimes of aggravated kidnapping, 30 years, deviant sexual assault, 60 years, and rape, 60 years, and also to a concurrent term for the crime of attempted murder, 60 years, all for a grand total of 210 years in the Illinois State Penitentiary. He has never confessed to murdering anyone and to this day maintains his innocence of the crimes and is currently in the Menard Correctional Center in Illinois. He will be eligible for parole in 2042, just shy of his 90th birthday. Edward Spritzer was convicted for the murders of Lorraine Borowski and Rose Beck Davis. He received the death penalty, but this sentence was commuted in 2003 when then-Governor George Ryan commuted the death penalty in Illinois. All prisoners on death row received automatic life sentences without the possibility of parole. He is currently serving his sentence in Stateville Correctional Center near Joliet, Illinois. Andrew Cocarellis was convicted for the murders of Lorraine Borowski and Rose Beck Davis. He was executed by lethal injection on March 17, 1999, at 12.30 a.m. The execution took place in Tams Correctional Center in Alexander County, Illinois. He also was the last prisoner executed in Illinois. The death penalty was officially abolished by Governor Pat Quinn on March 9, 2011. Thomas Cookerellis was convicted of the murder of Lorraine Borowski. Because of his cooperation with police after his arrest, he did not receive the death penalty, but got life without parole. Because of a legal error during his first trial, he received a new trial after an appeal. He then received a prison sentence of 70 years at this new trial, which made him eligible for parole in 2017. He walked out of prison a free man on March 29, 2019, and currently resides in Aurora, Illinois. Strange and Disturbing Occurrences After Robin Gick's arrest for the attempted murder of Beverly Washington, police went to his residence on North McVicker Street in Chicago. I won't give an exact address of the home because it still stands today and is a private residence. The interesting thing that was found in the home at the time, in a small room in the attic, was a makeshift satanic chapel, as Spritzer and the Cocorellis brothers put it. According to them, the room was lit only by candles, and on one side of the room was an altar with a red cloth draped over it, and six red and black inverted crosses adorned the walls of this room. After Geck's wife would leave for work, yes, he was married and had three children, some of their victims would be brought into this chapel and would be mutilated and murdered as Geck read from the Satanic Bible. 
Andrew Cocarellis lived in the Gecht home for a time and acted as a children's babysitter before they all wound up living at the Br'er Rabbit Motel after Gecht's separation from his wife. It was said that the occult and his obsession with it had been with him since childhood. During these killings in the home, the severed breasts of the victims were collected, according to Andy Cocarellis, in a box. And during these rituals, Gecht would pass the body parts around. The four men would eat them as a sick perversion of Catholic Holy Communion. During questioning by Chicago police, he was asked about his obsession with female breasts. And he replied that all the men in his family had a fixation on women's breasts going back to his great-grandfather. And all the men in his family had married or had relationships with the well-endowed women. Ed Spritzer and the Cocorellis brothers held the belief that Gecht, through these satanic rituals, obtained a supernatural power. The three men believed that Gecht had the power to draw people to himself, and that he could seemingly make people do whatever he wanted them to do. They claimed that out of fear, they did commit these heinous murders. Otherwise, if they didn't, they would become the next victim. Of course, it could only be construed as an excuse. The men seemed genuine about the claims of Gex's hold over them. Even the manager of the Br'er Rabbit Motel, when questioned by police, said the four men acted as if they were in a cult. And it seemed to him that Gex had a strange way of interacting with people. Also, some very odd occurrences happened to Gex's family after his incarceration. November 16th, 1988, Menard Correctional Center, Illinois. Robin Gecht had visitors on this day. Loretta Gecht, his mother, Rochelle, his sister, and his nephew, Nicholas Miller, who was three years old at the time. After having their time together, the family headed home. On their way home from the prison, the family was involved in in a horrific car accident. The car, which was being driven by Rochelle, got sandwiched between two semi-trucks and was crushed. Loretta and Nicholas were killed instantly. Rochelle, his sister, was on life support for almost five months before her death. On April 10th, 1989, she breathed her last. David Gecht, one of Robin's sons, was charged for the murder of Roberto Cruz. He was shot to death in the early morning hours of January 29th, 1999, after leaving Bristol's nightclub in Chicago. Cruz was the leader of the Spanish Lord Street Gang, a rival to David Geck's gang called the Insane Unknown Gang. David, along with two accomplices, were convicted of murder and now reside in the Pontiac Correctional Center in Pontiac, Illinois. One more interesting thing to note, Robin Gecht worked as an electrical contractor, and sometimes he worked for a rather sinister client. This client was another infamous serial killer, known to you as John Wayne Gacy. Yes, this John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy had said to police at different times that he had had an accomplice for some of his murders. While Gacy never named who this person was, and Gecht has never admitted to killing anybody, it is an interesting coincidence that one serial killer worked for another. Did they ever discuss what they did? Did Robin ever help John Wayne Gacy? Unless Gek decides to talk and tell people what he did, this will only remain pure speculation. Well, there you have it, the Ripper Crew. One of the most infamous and bloodthirsty gang of serial killers that you're ever going to hear about. I set about relating the facts of this case in as straightforward a manner as possible. All the information I said before you, the viewer, are the true facts of the case. Nothing was exaggerated. And one last thing. Next time you're walking the streets of your city, 
Just make sure not to accept rides from strangers. Unless you want to become a victim of another Ripper crew. Until next time.